So good morning, Myron. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I, you know, recently watched the film and uh, couldn't have loved a film more. I'm a big fan of musical theater. Uh, so congratulations. I think you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Sure. So let's get into it. I wanted to ask you, out of all the careers one could choose in this life, how did you decide on editing? I think editing chose me. I I just wanted to be an artist. Um, to be honest, I um, I love to draw. I love to write. I love to um, just make things with my hands. I just wanted to express myself as an artist. And at one point I thought I was gonna be an architect. I studied that for a couple of years and then fell into printmaking and painting and photography. And that photography led me to filmmaking. When I moved to the city, I was a basically a PA, like everybody in this business, you know, starting out and sleeping on somebody's floor in the Lower East Side and just broke as broke as hell, and um, you know, just found my way through production as a PA, and then I landed onto this TV show as a production PA called TV Nation, which was Michael Moore's first um, first uh, first uh, more popular uh, sort of version of his document documentaries. Yeah, and there was eight editors that worked on that TV show, and. Wow. I would, you know, uh, when I was done shooting for the day, I would drop off the, you know, the tapes, you know, it was old school. So we'd uh, literally be digitizing, you know, tapes straight from the camera. And I saw all these editors at work and um, somebody said, would you be interested in becoming a post PA? And I was like, yeah, well, um, that seems a little bit more enticing than locking up Times Square in the middle of winter. So I hung with those guys for a bit and they were some of the best, and they still are some of the best documentary editors um, around. There was David Zeef, um, Wendy Stanzler, David Tedeschi, who cuts all of um, Scorsese's docs. And shortly, I would say maybe two or three months after I started as post PA, I started um, learning things on the Avid, learning how to digitize, becoming like the night assistant and started getting assistant editor credits. And around that time, I was like, I really need to just pick something. I need to stick with a department. I need to either continue down the production route. Um, I thought I was going to maybe be an AC, uh, assistant cameraman, maybe, um, maybe a, a DP. But um, again, I, I, that life just didn't seem right at the time. And um, so I decided to just stick with it, stick with these guys really hustled my butt off. And um, and all those editors started asking me to join them on their jobs after that. And suddenly nice. I had this gigantic net, you know, I had eight editors who yeah. all wanted to help me along my way. I mean, that was a big, gigantic network. Suddenly yeah. from, from a PA to a post BA to an assistant editor, very quickly, I have to say. And then Wendy Stansler brought me on to uh, Sex and the City where I met Michael Berenbaum and Kate Sanford. You know, they started hiring me for more stuff. You know, you just, that network grows and grows and grows. And, and, and then um, suddenly I was on the editor path, you know, um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, wow, that's great. I mean, uh, to work with eight editors, it, it just increases your network exponentially. And uh, that's a that's a great story. I love I love that because, you know, so many people talk about the struggle and, you know, not finding gigs. And uh, sometimes it just clicks like that. So so that's awesome. So you did some work in television and uh, that's always a good start. You know, you get your chops because you're just getting bombarded with film. Uh, and then you went to work on a film called Velvet Goldmine as the assistant editor and Hedwig and the Angry Inch three years later as an additional editor, both which uh, Christine Vachon produced. Did she play a part in bringing you on to Hedwig? I mean, did you form a good relationship with her? Did she remember you? How did that come about? Well, I was a huge fan of her as a producer in general. I, I really sought it after working with, uh, I really wanted to work on Todd Haynes movies because I was obsessed as somebody in college. And then, um, I don't know how it happened, but basically, you know, somebody basically introduced me to Jim Lyons, um, who really became my mentor. And Jim basically, he cut every, everything for Todd for many, many years. And that's also how I met Christine and started working at 
killer films. And I think Christine liked me and, um, you know, uh, you know, I did an okay job on Velvet Goldmine, which was a very complicated film from the system editor point of view. It, it was also a musical. But funny enough, um, it was actually Andrew Marcus who cut, uh, who was the, the, the main editor on Hedwig. He really wanted to pick my brain as, a, as somebody who was making a musical, like from a technical standpoint. Like, how do we put, how do we technically do this? And I think he really wanted to bring me on this as an assistant. To, to some respect, but I, I'd already had cut a film between uh, Velvet Goldmine and Hedwig, and I think, or maybe two films. So I think I was, I didn't really want to be brought on as assistant. So I said that I would help him, but as an additional editor. So it was a little bit of a negotiation, to be honest with you, to, to be able to go into that film. And of course, you know, I did a good enough job on, you know, uh, Velvet Goldmine and, um, uh, Hedwig that I then uh, they brought me on to camp, uh, which is actually um, a co-production between Killer and Jersey Films, and to some respect, that's also how I got Garden State. Again, that that that, that network that network just sort of um, kind of building on each other. But I continue to be a huge fan of Christine. I love all of her work. Um, you know, there's been several almost opportunities to come back and they do a lot of New York work and I'm out in LA. So there, there's that, but, um, anyways, um, no, that's uh, a great, that's a great uh, group of people to be involved with. Uh, you know, I love all their work. And, uh, recently I watched, uh, the Iggy pop documentary, Jim Jarmusch's piggy, uh, Iggy pop documentary, give me shelter. I don't know if you've seen it, but, uh, they mentioned velvet goldmine in it. And, uh, you know, growing up and coming from the, uh, uh, late seventies, uh, you know, sort of that was my era. So I, I very much uh, resonate with, uh, with, with a lot of that, uh, filmmaking and, you know, the artistic sensibility there. So very cool. If I could speak a little t more to that, like I, I really loved, um, you know, uh, music, but I wasn't exposed to T-Rex or Bowie or, um, you know, Iggy Pop that much. So it was like really being exposed to this huge music, you know, that, this huge part of a musical history and uh, musical history and um, or rock history rather, um, and you know, anyways. Um, so and then also just learning how to like you know organize a musical was just like a huge endeavor as well. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it's it's such a unique skill in the film editing you know world. Uh, I remember doing it back on film and having to code things in sync to playback. And, you know, it's, it's a science unto itself, uh, you know, like so much in editing, there are so many kind of specific, you know, tasks that you have to do and music uh, is a big one. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to ask you about that a little bit later on. So uh, would, sure. would you consider that, um, you know, sort of what you just mentioned, your, your break? I mean, was, was that the project that kind of put you on the map, do you think? I think that it was actually this film, Raising Victor Vargas, that I edited that really made a big difference because Zach Braff ended up really uh, loving that movie. Um, so I think to some respect, that's why I ended up on Garden State. And, and also Paul White, um, who I did in good company with in American Dreams and Little Fockers, you know, he really loved that film as well. So I really got my big break um, into the studio world because of this little indie, which was shot for like half a million dollars, Lower East Side Kids, you know, very re reminiscent of or, uh, or relatable to um, to In the Heights to some degree. So, you know, I really thank Pete Sale, who the director was um, of that film for giving me a shot to work with him. And um, I really think that was a big break. Even though it was a tiny little film, not many people have seen it. Um, but people who have seen it, you know, really love it. And um, I just think that made all the difference in the world. Wow. I haven't seen it. So I'll have to check that out. That's uh, that's exciting. But you bring up a good point how quite often it's not the big sort of, you know, box office hit that gets editors, uh, you know, kind of on the radar of other directors. It's, it's smaller films. A good friend of mine, Dave Moritz, cut um, Rushmore. And... You know, that film pretty much established his career. I mean, he worked with yeah. Wes for a long yeah. time, but the fact that yeah. he worked on Rushmore, 
you, you know, made so many people, especially, you know, like the next generation of filmmakers who kind of grew up and that was their film, you know, yeah. want to work with him. So that's a cool story. Yeah. So Garden State is a favorite of mine. And, uh, you know, I just remember seeing that and thought, you know, what a beautiful little little film. How did that project come, come about? And what do you remember best about that experience working with Zach? Well, Zach and I uh, met through Jersey Films because Jersey was basically a co-producer with um, Killer Films when I did this film camp. And... And again, he had, Zach had seen Raising Victor Vargas, which he had really loved. So he he actually hired Judy Becker, who was a production designer, who then went on to basically do many of David O. Russell's films. You know, I just got my foot in the door. And I met with Zach actually in L.A. And he, I was in L.A. for a visit, but I was still living in New York. And he said to me, um, would you be interested in cutting this film in New York, but then moving to LA? And I basically said to Zach, I'll, you know, I love the script so much, I'll edit it in your bathroom if you want me to. Like, <laughs> so, just tell me where. But seriously, I just really love the script. And you know, a lot of these opportunities you get as an editor to work with new people has to do with you already got your foot in the door because they like your work to some degree, or you asked enough favors from enough people to get you an interview. But then I always, I always go in guns blazing with my enthusiasm and, and really my heart. You know, I try to go in with, cause I don't think I'm like any better editor than anyone else out there. I just feel like, but what I have is heart and passion. And I try to, communicate that to the director as quickly as possible because you know you only get like 15 minutes maybe or something so you just you have to you have to go in you know as hard as you can with, and also without being annoying but long story short he hired me <laughs> um and i you know I, I basically cut um the movie in new york while they were shooting and pretty quickly i started to notice that there was something different about the movie that I thought might be really cool to show to an audience. Even in the, that assembly stage, I got pretty excited. And then we moved to LA and, you know, I think that the most exciting time with Zach was just finding the film together in, in the edit room. We were at, yeah, we actually ended up cutting in his house. He had, just bought a house in Laurel Canyon and it was completely empty, no furniture in there, just my avid basically sitting in the middle of it. You know it's special, but you still have to find it together. We actually had to cut a character out of that movie. You know, we did a lot of restructuring, as many, you know, we had a lot of needle drops obviously, but they weren't always the right needle drops. So just, you know, um, finding the film together, screening the film, you know, um, just getting really excited together, working on the comedy together. And then of course, you know, the, 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 the coolest experience of after finishing the film is showing the film. So when we showed it at Sundance and you hear these stories all the time, you know, the big Sundance premiere, but man, that premiere, it was, I was little, I was so nervous. I, I couldn't even sit in the theater. I was in the back. I was actually in and out of like the projection room because, you know, I was like worried print would break or something you know i was just t terrified you know i <laughs> just wanted to throw up i couldn't enjoy it at all but that <laughs> i know the feeling I've been there. Yeah. yeah yeah just, just you know nerve-wracking but also really sp special so um you know being in that big echoes room you know i think that when you start having those goosebumps you know in the back of your neck and you start to you know, the tears start to well up and you're just like, that's, you just know there's something special there, so. Yeah, that's when you know you've got something. Um, you know, I remember, you know, watching dailies on certain films where, you know, you're just so moved and that continues. And then when you show it to an audience and they have that same reaction, uh, it's very satisfying. It's, uh, it's one of the best parts of the job. So how did you meet John Chu? Um, well, it, again, it's, it's the network. I, you know, the agencies, they tend to, um, they just tend to throw a lot at you. And so my agent was like, here's 20 films that are going to be made. There's the $200 million film that's going to be made that you have no chance of possibly making. And then you have this tiny little indie and there's like some between you're like, I don't know. They all seem 
great. I would just want a job. And then Crazy Rich Asians was on that list. And at the time, I actually was like, I'm not sure about Crazy Rich. That sounds like a weird racist <laughs> title for a film. It's like, it's like, are they? Is this a satire? Like, I couldn't, I couldn't tell. Uh, I was a fan of John Chu and the step. The, his step up movies and the never say never documentary like i was i was and even some of his genre work i i really i really liked him as a filmmaker and was interested in working with him but for some reason i was just like i just don't know about this movie somebody from warner brothers i think it was darlene Gor gorgonzola she called me up and said myron uh, I think you're on the short list for um, Crazy Rich Asians. I was like, I am? I didn't do, I didn't like, I didn't put any feelers out. And he's like, yeah, you're on the short list. I was like, well, I guess I need to treat this a little bit more seriously if I'm on some short list for a movie. And I guess that means that the studio was trying to find editors and they were compiling lists. And anyways, long story short, I started taking it a little bit more seriously. Like, okay, this is a real job opportunity. I need a job. Uh, John Chu's cool. So um, I tried to figure out who else was connected to this film. And basically, one of the producers was this guy, Brad Simpson, who was actually the post supervisor back in the day on Velvet Goldmine. And he worked for Killer Films f for years. So I called up Brad and I said, Brad, um, I know we haven't s spoken in a while, but you know, um, I hear that I might be in some kind of short list. Do you think you could put in a good word to John Chu for me? And he's like, yes. And by the way, I'll send you the script. So he sent me the script and then I read it. And I was like, oh my God, I love this script so much. I have to do this me. I was so crazy. Like what, um, this is gonna be incredible. I, I need to be a part of this. This is gonna be history, you know, if we can make this film right. And basically um, two weeks later, I'm on Skype with John Chu. He's already in Malaysia prepping Crazy Rich Asians. And it was the same thing. It was like literally, and of course I was like horrible interviewer and on, in general, but also <laughs> on Skype. to do it on Skype, you know, it was like, how am I going to connect to this person emotionally? Anyways, it was- How do you get it across? How do you get that interest yeah. and passion across over the yeah. Zoom? <laughs> so, so I basically just try to do what I've done in the past, which was um, just speak from the heart and speak with passion. And, um, and he gave me a shot and um, lucky. And then basically, again, a couple of weeks later, I had another Skype interview with Nina Jacobson, which is, who is producing partner. And Nina, of course, runs studios and has done amazing films as a producer. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I made an impression on her as well. And, you know, and then a couple of weeks later, they're like, you know, um, pack your bags, you're going to Malaysia and Singapore. Wow. And then wow. I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, so I'm like, <laughs> then, you know, calling on my wife. Are you okay if I go away for two or three months to the other to side Malaysia. of the world? And, <laughs> and she was like, well, do I have a choice? No, uh, no, she was very supportive. And she was like, yeah, it's a huge opportunity. And, you know, go for it. And because, you know, when you go to Malaysia or Singapore, you can't like, you can't go home for the weekend. You know, right. you're pretty much, right. you know, the, the jet lag, <laughs> the jet lag is so terrible um, that you're, you're basically, you know, you kind of messed up for a couple of weeks. And um, so anyways, um, you know, I went there and it was good that I did because I got to spend a lot of time with John, you know, um, on set. We actually projected dailies two to three times a week. So we did like the old school, you know, sitting in the wow. room watching dailies together. Um, and then, he, you know, I would send cuts to him. He would come to the edit rooms on the weekend and work. we'd work together. So we were able to build that trust and working relationship over the course of that shoot and you know we can get to know each other a little bit cool 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 so yeah so i was going to ask you about your working relationship on in the heights um and how it's evolved since you first worked together on crazy rich asians basically from crazy rich asians we i've worked with john uh, on two pilots just evolving our relationship as two artists working together in a room so and that is a lot to do with trust and and taste and uh freedom 
you know, him giving me freedom to basically explore the footage, even if he has a design for a scene, which he often does, um, he'll say, do you want my input? And I'll say no, or sometimes I'll say yes, but usually it's me just exploring the footage on my own and finding the little nuggets, the kernels, the heart um, by myself without any input. And I think that having that trust allows us to like for me at least it makes me like a complete artist because i don't have to worry about failing i don't have to worry about him judging me i could just try stuff and i know it's not all going to be right it, a lot i'm going to fail half the time if not more but at least i could just explore and um be a you know i've always said that if i could just figure out how to be a really good finger painter like i've become a really great editor so i've been really like um, pushing myself to just allow myself freedom to paint with the edits, paint with the footage, um, allow myself to explore it in a really fluid way. And John giving me the trust to do that, to just explore and, you know, fill it out before he even gets in there. Um, it, I think that's really, you know, why um, we're doing something, I, I hope, special, you know, something that's special. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's a that's a, a great observation and a, and a great description of, you know, the place where we can get as editors, uh, where we do. Pr I, I mean, it's the best place to be, in, in my opinion, where you can really, like you say, be an artist, you know, just completely explore the material. Uh, you know, I talked to Amy Duddleston and, you know, she talked about sketching stuff out. And it really is. It's like painting because you know, a lot of times I'll start a scene and I'll just start throwing stuff together. And really it's kind of like, you know, you're you're on a journey that you, you don't know where you're going. And, you know, you've got a general idea, you've read the script and you've seen the footage, but uh, that trust you you talked about is, is so critical, you know, to make a good experience in the cutting room for, you know, an editor and a director. Um, great story, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I want to talk more about the creative process, uh, you know, right from the start of In the Heights, you establish this beautiful cutting rhythm, you know, tempo and pace and, you know, obviously helped by Miranda and his collaborators and their wonderful songs. Uh, but it's a lot of material. Uh, what were your initial thoughts and instincts about the way to tackle that? Uh, panic, panic and despair. No. <laughs> No, I, um, you know, it is very overwhelming. I, I will be honest. It always is because you're staring at an empty timeline and it's, it's literally like, where do I start? But um, I really always start with just letting the footage wash over me like an audience member. I, I oftentimes will try to sit back as far away from the avid as possible and just watch the dailies like, you know, like I was in the theater. And sometimes I'll have my laptop Sometimes I'll just have a pad of paper and I'm just taking notes. I'm just reacting to the footage like um, like an audience member and just remind myself there's certain lines or performances I like, certain shots I like. When do I cry? When do I laugh? You know, and they're just general, just almost just like really random notes to remind myself on each take, on each camera. Um, sometimes I'll watch all the cameras going on at once it's really just time efficiency to be honest with you just watching them down the first time didn't i read somewhere that you had like eight cameras on that uh on that early scene and in the heights on the club stuff we had um we had uh, multiple cameras um uh, most of the stuff is uh went up to like three cameras but then we had and then of course i have multiple setups you know some of the setups would go up to like you know 20 setups something ridiculous and you know something like ninety six thousand. i don't even I can't remember where it, the letters end, um, the double letters. Yeah. You know, just letting that footage wash over me is really just like that that first step. And then I, after I do that, then I literally go through the, I go through one camera at a time, selecting, making select reels and building up my selects for a scene or for a musical number. And, and then start building once I feel like I have organized my, thoughts enough. I spent a lot of time organizing, probably way too much time, a lot of procrastination, you know, um, but, but I try to be as 
as thorough while I'm procrastinating and thinking, I try to be as thorough as I can with trying to find the little nuggets from the get-go. So especially when you're being drowned by footage like that, you just have to like, just say, okay, it's a process and I need to start the process and organize the footage that way I can find it again. Um, instead of yeah. just, pit, you know, uh, I rarely use the multi-cam fu function to cut. Um, I almost do everything for my select roles. Yeah, that's really the beginning process. Yeah, yeah, but I agree. It's overwhelming, and it's and it's quite different from when I started in you know, and and it was film. Uh, you didn't get as much footage. You didn't get nearly as much footage. And these days, I mean, I remember the story of you know they shot a million feet of film on Apocalypse Now. Um, you know, I had a, over a million feet of film on a you know thirty million dollar. Improv right. comedy, the last film I right. shot. And it, <laughs> no. it, it's just like, holy, holy cow, how am I going to do this? You, you know, so, I know. I, but I do like that, uh, you know, what you said about, you know, you just got to kind of like take a deep breath and and just start watching the film and going through it one thing at a time. Because what, my, you know, my initial thing is, you know, I get really anxious and I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do this in the time allotted. But it's really important to kind of like throttle back and just start doing it, you know, one take at a time. So cool story. Yeah. I, I, I like that. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the material might have been coming over, you know, an extended period of time. I mean, with second unit and things like that for that first sequence. Um, so how long were you working on that sequence before you showed it to John, for example? Or did you show it to him, you know, sort of unfinished? That seems, you know, it's really big, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, they shot a, a majority of that um, that opening number over the course of the entire shoot. So yeah. there were so many locations. There were so many characters. In fact, even to the post-process, we didn't um, have the aerial footage. I had, like, Google Map of George Washington Bridge and Washington Heights. And we had stock footage that basically represented, like, the community chorus you know, we just like, I just talk wow. to my assistants and say, will you just download stuff of people getting ready for work or taking their kids to school? So actually for the longest time, it was pretty incomplete. You know, really, really trying to find um, all the pieces, you know, even through the post process. But, you know, I would show him, you know, little sections as we were shooting of what we did have. John really wanted to establish the visual language of the film. And I had done a little of the, like I, they had shot a lot of B-roll of just random shots of Washington Heights. And I knew I wanted to use some of that stuff to establish like, you know, like the bird boxes or somebody looking out the window or a little train go by. Like I knew I wanted little, almost documentary snippets to cut to. Um, and then he wanted to also establish like the magical realism. And so, you know, that um, that manhole cover wasn't supposed to like slip like a record scratch, you know, a record scratch. So, you know, we were like turning to VFX and say, can you guys move this thing? And they're like, yep. And they're like, you know, we knew there was going to be gum there, but we didn't know it was going to rotate. And we didn't know there was going to be like words on the screen and we didn't know we we're going to crash to the beach. Like I was like telling my assistants, we like, would you, you know, download um, any any footage of waves crashing, you know, and because John had the idea and I found this amazing aerial of of a wave crash. But of course, it was like really low resolution. So it wasn't until like six months later that we could actually go to the dr and shoot you know at the actual like beaches um oh, wow. or that we could shoot the aerial footage of washington heights like you know we had to ask for more money to do that kind of stuff so you know and then we had you know we had to figure out the the jump cuts together you know and uh with john and you know the 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 syncopated edits of like turning on the coffee maker and you know, there's just so, you know, whether to do split screens, when to have Yusnavi break the fourth wall, we had a lot of stuff where he did do it. And we also had straight where he didn't do it. You know, we had those options. So it was really a lot of us just playing together. And John's attitude was like, we just really want to tell the audience that we're going to playful with them, but we're going to also like 
keep it grounded at the same time. You know, we're gonna we're gonna start and stop the music a couple of times. Like we're it's gonna be a little, you know, disjointed, a little abrupt in ways that you don't expect. You, just to kind of wake you up, you know, kind of tell the audience that this isn't exactly what you think it's gonna be. You know, and, yeah, and keep them on their toes, keep them, keep surprising them. Well, you certainly did it, yeah. and uh, you succeeded, in my opinion, uh, because you know it was very rhythmic and uh, you know unique, and I really uh, I, I enjoyed it so much. I'm a I'm a huge fan of musical theater to begin with. When I was a kid, you know, I lived in New York, and uh, my my grandparents and parents used to take me to uh, see all these Broadway shows. And ever since then, you know, I just, I love a good musical. <laughs> so, uh, me too. You know, that... Me too. I, I grew, I, I grew up going to, um, musicals, uh, as a kid. Um, but in like San Diego, I didn't, wasn't exposed to Broadway too much later. And, you know, there's, um, and then of course I love, you know, films like, uh, The Music Man and Grease and Purple Rain. And then, you know, when I got older, you know, I, you know, became fans of like fame and all that jazz, you know, you, you start to, your tastes start to evolve, you know, you, and, you know, chorus line, you know, it just like, it all becomes swirls in your brain. And then, you know, but, you know, on this film, we were just like, okay, we need to adhere to certain traditions of a musical, but we also wanted to break it a little bit. We wanted to be brave in it. But sometimes like when you have a lot of ideas, like you're like words on the screen, magical realism, you know, jump cuts, you know, split screens, like that could be like really throwing a lot at the audience. And that, you know, to make, to, for you to say that it, it actually feels cohesive means a lot to me because I've done that before in other films where I throw everything at it, every trick, and you know, and just just to keep it interesting, keep people on their feet, and it could become a big mess. You know, it could be like, yeah. oh my god, like can can you, you know, you got dissolves, <laughs> you got you know, you know, can we uh, redo this? You know, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, um, so I've been on the other side of that where you know, um, you're like you just chill out a little bit, buddy. Um, you buy your tickets and, and take your chances, man. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> it's uh... <laughs> So let me ask you, were all the musical sequences shot to playback? Um, I would say like 70% of them were as playback. We had a lot of live recordings. Um, a lot, Oftentimes that we would start the songs live, whether it was like the beginning of 96,000, the majority of that is live. You know, Champagne is completely live. So they would basically have, um, you know, playback tracks, the instrumentals playing back in their ear and then they could record live on set there's a lot of mix and match you know carnival there's a, a lot of live sections in in that number and we we just had to be prepared to do anything like yeah if they decided that yeah i think when they first talked to me they were just like oh yeah we're not gonna have any live and then they're like no actually everybody on this cast can sing dance and act so we're doing live when we can like <laughs> yeah. no no yeah. we're like so, you know, sometimes it would have playback in their ears. Sometimes they would have playback, you know, 96,000 would be playing back to like 500 extras all at the same time. Or sometimes they would have somebody on set playing live piano to either cue the, um, cue the actors or get them in the right rhythm or the right key. They would have to cue the dancers in correctly to do certain, you know, sections of the dance correctly. So, um, you know, they're playing back and recutting the song on the fly on the set, you know, using proto rigs. And so it, it's almost like its own, like a uh, department, you know, playback, yeah. you know, it is its own department, but it's, it's on a musical. It's like, really, it's like on steroids. So. Yeah. Yeah. So much of our audience is made up of aspiring editors, but could you explain to us uh, what shooting a sequence to playback is and, and tell us your workflow for cutting scenes, you know, shot in this manner. Yeah, so playback is is basically pl literally playing back the musical track for the actors, and they do that in order for them to lip sync, you know, a, a the lyrics, you know, and for the dancers to give them something to dance to. It's something that has probably been done since early musicals, um, and then of course on music videos, you know, they do that as well. The big difference is, you know, when you have like live recording, then you're like, okay, let's get rid of all the vocals and let's let them sing the vocals out live, like 
like dialogue. And there was a time code reference literally saying like where you're beginning and in the song. So I can use that reference to basically find my way in the footage. So when I'm getting the dailies, I may get, you know, a hundred takes of the whole song you know, from different setups, different camera angles. But two minutes in, it's like, it's going to be this vocal section. So it's kind of a way to, for me to find my way uh, with a song. And when I, when I first approach it, again, I look at it almost like any other scene. I just look at it for performance, what moves me, where am I crying? Um, you mentioned before that you know, were getting moved by the footage. I, every day I was crying and sending videos to my DP and, and John. Um, you know, Alice Brooks is an amazing DP and John who had been, you know, basically working since college together. And I'm just like, I don't know why I'm crying again, but you know, this is what you did to me. And I'm going to remember, I'm going to remember that. And for me, I, I like to break down musical numbers by sections. Yeah. So breaking it down from like, you know, the boys on the street for 96,000, I could just pull selects just to, just to cut that section, which is really helpful but then you you know you get to a section like the salon ladies like i could just cut their little section or benny entering the pool area or um you know sunny in the water with the bone breaker dancers you know um you know i could really um make it less overwhelming for me by really breaking it down um into little mini scenes and then i can have this um yeah, just this miscellaneous footage of texture of, you know, of that beautiful dreadlock dancer um, in the shower, you know, um, or the kid dancing on the, the picnic table. You know, I can have all those little pieces available for me to plug in wherever I think is appropriate from a um, story point of view. And that's no different if I did a regular scene um, or if I was doing a big musical number. But um, and then I could, again, I could use the time code to sort of find my way in the song to help me kind of get in the, the proximate place if it's sort of you know uh, lyric dependent or music dependent. But of course, all the like free floating miscellaneous stuff can go anywhere, so it doesn't matter what the time code says, or you know I can just kind of forget about it. And then sometimes. You know, I'm mixing and matching between different choruses because, you know, the, the chorus might be the same. So then I could, like, I could take that stuff that was later in the number, I could put it earlier. And, um, but that's, you know, I'm basically using the playback as the building block for all that. And then if, the, you know, if we have live singing, then I just, again, I just treat it like dialogue in a scene. You know, I just treat it like what's the best performance, you know. Great explanation. I love talking about that stuff. So, you know, it's this incredible, you know, marriage of the of the technical and the creative, uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with that many uh, elements. Uh, you know, it seems overwhelming, uh, but, I, but I like how you talked about cutting in sections. It's like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, you know, so. <laughs> I know. It really does feel that way. It feels like... Um, Again, like you're staring at that empty timeline. I just recently I I posted on Timeline Tuesday my my complete timeline, but I really want to post an empty timeline because <laughs> that is really the place that most editors relate to. Is that you know where do I start? You know how do I start? You know and so breaking down of the sections are really helpful. You know to to make it less overwhelming. And by the way, it took me almost ten years of me cutting in a different way for me to discover this system. You know, I used to be like, I gotta dive right in and just start cutting. And I just miss so much. Like I, I feel so bad for all those early films that I cut. I could, I could have even cut those even better if I had, um, but I just sort of over time like realized, okay, this is the system that works for me. Yeah, it, it's so true. I mean, you know, there are these editors that kind of just get it when they're young. But, you know, I think a lot of us when we're young feel the exact same way. You know, you're so overwhelmed and you're just like, and the more patience you develop, or at least the more patience that I developed, the more I both enjoyed the process and and the better I became at it. So uh, so let's talk about the visual effects. There seem to be quite a few in this in this film. Uh, the scene where Nina and Benny dance on the wall a la Fred Astaire and Royal Wedding, uh, you know, particularly comes to mind. 
but also the animations throughout. Talk about your VFX workflow. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I had a great uh, VFX um, supervisor, Mark Russell, and Tim, um, God, Tim Dunnington. I have, to, I have to get you the right name of that. But, but Tim was our, our VFX editor, and, bo you know, and then we had um, a bunch of great compositors or, that were actually with us to do temp work um, as, you know, as we were uh, playing in the edit. And so having that department just, you know, with us the entire time was really helpful. Something with like when the sun goes down, like we knew that it was going to take probably majority of posts to do that VFX work. So we, we tackled that number first really early in the process. And, you know, it's because uh, that number specifically didn't have too many edits. It was more about the camera work and about the, the, the elegance of the dance. We just really, you know, looked at that footage really carefully together to make sure we we're picking the right pieces. And that set piece is a, sort of an engineering feat where the wall mechanically goes down while the camera is moving and I still don't quite understand how they did it. Um, but it was, uh, it was, it was great. You know, of course that was one of the days I went to set cause like, I gotta see this. I think that's how they did it in, um, y y you know, in the, in the Fred Astaire film. I think, you know, the, the set actually, the walls actually move and stuff. So. Right. You're right. They're, the, the actors are adjusting to the, um, to the actual set moving. And then the camera of course is, you know, is moving as well to basically, you know, or, or not moving to basically, you know, trick us, you know, trick our eyes. You didn't have a huge crew though. Um, you know, you, you had a first assistant and a second assistant in the credits I saw. I mean, it seems to me like, boy, that, that's a lot of VFX work, but uh, was, was the visual effects department kind of, um, you know, gaffing a lot of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it was real. I had, you know, I had 20 people to be honest in that I, you know, I had two music editors. I had, you know, I had a extra assistant editor. I had a VFX coordinator and um, one other person under him. So it, you know, and then we had, you know, a lot of VFX vendors that we went out to as well. So, um, so there was, it, it was, it was pretty robust for, you know, I mean, it, the film was $50 million. So uh, it was big, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't West Side Story. It wasn't hundred million dollars, which you right. know, Spielberg had. So we were still, you know, we <laughs> come on, right. Spielberg. Um, um, come on, let's do it. Um, but uh, <laughs> show me the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got fifty here. Um, it's it's a lot of people it takes to uh, to skin that cat. And you know, for for you know, aspiring editors, you, you know, have have a little bit of take a little bit of comfort in the fact that you will get some help, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with these massive projects. Uh, and that's, yeah. that's and sort and of again, a comfort. You know, it totally is because again, you know, it could be overwhelming or just like, um, how are we going to do when the sun goes down? Like, how are we going to like, well, I just have to pick the, I just have to pick the performance and make yeah. a very elegant edit and do that quickly. Um, that way the departments can, you know, get started and then of course yeah. there's a few shots here and there where you're just like i don't know if i could choose yet here's some extra footage you know because you know you find your way once the some of the vfx get closer as well so sure. um you know so there's some handles to it you know some of the work it won't be long now with like the fabric flying over the buildings that took a really long time to to develop like how is that going to look like you know what is the weight of these things like, you know, how real should we make them? You know, it, it was a it was a pretty long process trying to figure out something that is seems really simple in some ways, but make it really elegant and, you know, magical. I was just thinking that, you know, you really did, you know, there's a fine line in visual effects and, and, and you know, maybe just the film lent itself to this, but, you know, it was, ma you know, it had that magical realism, whereas, you know, you felt as if, you bought it, you know what I mean? You bought it and you enjoyed it, or I did. Uh, you, you have a little bit of, of sort of like leeway in those kinds of things, but but that was that was beautiful stuff. I mean, that was really well done. 
we really wanted to keep everything, you know, the same thing with like what we were doing editorially and even mixing the music, we wanted to keep everything grounded. And it was okay if there was a little bit of like, that's come on, that's fake. And, but, but as a, we wanted to get it as close as possible um, because it was important for us to, even though they were singing about their dreams and we were illustrating that visually, we just wanted to also keep it real and as closely as we could. And um, that's not always so easy when you're working with all these artists who have their own interpretation, they bring their own, you know, version of what that is. And so it's just a constant back and forth with a, these just amazing artists who are doing stuff on their computers, you know, all over the city, you know, some in other parts of the world. So it's really amazing to work with them all. But just our mantra was like, we're doing all this crazy stuff where it's like, you know, animation or jump cuts or writing on the screen or somebody on an iPad or fabric being thrown over the, over uh, buildings or dancing on the side of a building. All of it, we're just like, but we let's keep it cohesive as as much as we can, even though we're doing so, we're throwing to the audience. Let's try to keep it grounded somehow, <laughs> somehow in all this. And there was also failures too. You know, there's we had. Um, animation over at, at one point over almost of 90 almost all of 96,000 and mm. we actually had a, a different animator at one point because we were like mm. we were like this is the style we should do the animation and at one point Lynn saw the movie and he was like why did you draw a little, draw over my entire uh, musical number <laughs> we're just like okay <laughs> we get we get it we get it. We're getting a little too crazy. So we had Rethink. to pull way back from that. Yeah, we had to pull way because you know Benny does all this stuff of like writing out the check. At one point, they're like, "You're gonna see the check, and you're gonna see him like writing on the check." Or when uh -huh. you know your snobby is like doing the window, you'd actually see the window. But it's at, at some point, it just became too much. Um, then we found like a style of animation that might work a little bit more, like a little bit more kind of graffiti style, a little bit almost like or chalk style a combination of both and we're like well why don't we just do it over the the top of the number just to give you a little flair of something and um so um there was a lot of times where we we're just like um trying ideas we're like this is this is bad this is just yeah. looks clunky or it doesn't or it just um it's not organic to the rest of the movie um let's just try something else so it's not always like you have the right idea you know, and you find it, you over the course of the whole um, making the movie, you're just, you're playing things. You try, you know, you try not to go down the rabbit hole too far because that's very costly. But, um, and that's why the in-house guys were really great because they could approximate, they could sketch out ideas um, uh, for very, you know, for like, you know, $50 a shot versus $5,000 a shot. So Yeah, um, quickly and so. kind of cheaply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I love what, what you came up with, with the animations. I think uh, they were very, you know, they felt very organic to me. So, uh, so good work. So switching gears, you recently directed an episode of, uh, you know, a series that John produced, uh, Home After Dark which I saw the other night. Um, tell us about that. Did you enjoy it? Was uh, directing always in your career plan? Do you plan on doing more of it or would you like to? Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest with you, when I first got into the business, like everybody else, um, you know, I don't think you dream of being a film editor um, or a DP. You usually want to direct, you usually want to make movies. Um, but I was very practical when I was young and I, and also I was poor. So I, I was like, I needed to make money. I need, and I think, you know, I was very practical. Like I wanted to pick a department where I could like literally like start making a living and becoming an assistant editor. And to some degree, I don't think I really had the confidence and the voice to be a director. I just didn't feel like I was there as a, as, as an artist. I, d I wasn't. And um, so I put that away in a box <laughs> and tried to just get to be as good of an editor as I could as possible. And I edited the pilot of Home Before Dark and the second episode. And then John went off to basically prep in the Heights and I continued to uh, craft and hone as an editor the, the entire first season with the other editors and the showrunner. And that became, it became like my baby. Like it was like, not only was I 
um, f finishing up the first season for John, but I was also getting to become very close with Dana Fox. And it just felt like the right place to be as an artist. And um, finish in the Heights, cutting in the Heights. And then uh, Dana Fox calls me up again and say, well, I really want you to come back for the second season. And I say, well, I, I, I don't know if I can commit to the entire season because there's other opportunities. And like, I really want you, how about you edit, co-produce with me and direct, and I'll get you an episode to direct. And I was just like, okay, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do it. Let's go. Twist my you know, arm. And of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, I had put it out there as well that it was something I was interested in. And, and you know, it, she really took a big swing for me because people like me at this age don't always get those opportunities, you know, as a first time director. She just gave me a shot. And, um, and it was, you know, it, for me, it was just a really great way for me to explore, even though it was the same medium, but as a director, um, as an artist, and and to work with actors who I loved already from editing them, and I knew them, I knew them really well. So I came in there from a place of strength because I knew, in theory, what I already liked as an editor. Um, I just had to try to communicate, you know, if I wanted to literally direct them in other. Uh, ways, you know, other uh, other colors, other emotions, you know, how to get there. It was, you know, and then of course I was, I didn't know anything. I was literally like learning on the job, you know. Um, uh, I had to join yeah. DGA. DGA has a great um, first time uh, filmmaker, uh, first time director program where you workshop for an afternoon. I was my my uh, my peers was Elizabeth Moss, who was going to direct Hands Ma Handmaid's Tale for the first time, and all these other directors. Eric St Eric Stoltz was like my advisor, you know. So it was kind of like a really great way for me to just learn how to direct, and then of course learn how to really direct by being on set. I Howie Deutsch was the producing director. He directed um, Pretty in Pink and Some Kind of Wonderful. Yeah, he was already a hero of mine, and uh, you know, f as a fan of his movies, and um, and so he was, you know, he was really hard on me, and really like, you know, he bought me a watch. He was like, "You need to watch because um, time is going to be your enemy," you know, and um, and you know, whip me into shape. You know, I really needed somebody to like you got to be out of the scene in 15 minutes, you know? Wow. It's like, yeah. why well, I, I have five other angles planned. No, you have one <laughs> more angle planned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As editors, we, uh, we have the luxury of time being in our little, uh, our little caves, but, uh, when you're on the set, you're on the firing lines, right? Yeah. And John was really supportive. Like I, he was, just, I was, of course I went to him and said, can we give me advice, any tips? And, it was like you need, you just need to gather. You have to gather magic. You know, it's like that's what I bring to you. It's like gather these pieces, and you got to find those pieces. And um, that you're a collector, and um, so I just took that at heart. And and but then also like kind of laughing at me. It's like yeah, you, you thought it was easy what I do, right? Like you know, just <laughs> I had so I had so much more empathy, you know, for all the directors I've ever worked for, and screamed at through my monitors saying. <laughs> Why did you yeah. move on? Or you didn't get this or get that? <laughs> I mean, it's so, I mean, I have, time is, yeah, there, there's no, you're just out of time as soon as you show up on a set. Like there's right. no, and w editing, you're just like, should I, should I have another coffee before? <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Procra um, yeah. And, Procrastinators and, unite as in the editing room. <laughs> you know, it's like. Eh, yeah. Yeah. I can do yeah, that after There's lunch. no such thing. There's no such thing in directing, and um, but yeah. um, but it was good because I you know I came off of Home Before Dark and in the Heights. If I could speak a little to out like after directing and cutting more on that season, and a really good friend of mine actually cut my episode, uh, Phil Harrison, who actually cuts on uh, cut on Mr. Robot and uh, cut the pilot of A Teacher, and did, anyways, I've known him for over 20 years. But long story short, between the first season of um, Home Before Dark, In the Heights, directing, and also then editing more of In the Heights, I just fell so deeply in love with editing and making, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I just, um, I become 
so um, in love with the process again. You know, I just really um, love what we do, you know, yeah. and um, I get it, yeah. man. I get it. Yeah. And as, especially coming yeah. out of this freaking pandemic, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's it's just been such a dark year. And uh, yeah. That's really nice. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and to get what, to do what we do again and, and the fact that there's really quite a lot of work, uh, you know, and things are, are kind yeah. of looking up, you know, in spite of the fact yeah. that, uh, you know, so many behemoths or, uh, you know, behemoths <laughs> are, are financing this crap. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's a joy. You know, it's, you know, artists need uh, benefactors and uh, it's, yeah. it's nice yeah. that there's a lot they of sure stuff. Do stuff out there yeah yeah that's that's really no, cool I'm, man. I, I, I i'm so thankful i'm so thankful that so many of my friends and so many young editors and so many artists from vfx to crew members to composers musicians production designers cut they're just we 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 get to make stuff and and just just falling in love with the craft again because i do think it's a long journey with you know us as, as editors from you know, from job to job, and it can be you. It can beat you down out over time, um, but I've always had a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed quality. I've always been a cheerleader when it comes to the stuff I work on. But I've really felt it over the last couple of years, and the pandemic made me even more thankful for. You know, I wasn't working for like six months, like for a lot of people, it just all yeah. shut down. Um, yeah. And um, and you know, literally feeling like um, I don't know if I can. Um, afford to pay for my house, let alone, you know, um, continue my career, just ready to like, just kill it, like being so thankful for every single edit, you know, every single yeah. minute we get to do this thing um, has been great. Awesome. That's so that's so awesome. Um, okay, so as you well know, becoming a successful filmmaker is a, di a difficult task, not for the faint of heart. Uh, what advice can you give some of our audience of aspiring filmmakers, editors, etc., who are just starting out in our business? Well, first of all, um, be patient. Trust that this is a process. It's a long journey. Call me up, email me, you know, email you, reach out to people's work that you like and ask them if they can have a cup of coffee with you. Get on the phone. Tell me about the journey. Have people who inspire you around your life and then try to make things just try to make things you know yeah. you've got a camera right here you know like go shoot some stuff and cut it together because there'll be a lot of time between you know uh, jobs and that'll be very frustrating but you got in this business to be an artist and so you have to start that process and keep at it so building your network being patient make stuff on the side be really enthusiastic um don't be lazy there's a lot of assistants out there that they're just waiting for somebody to like tell me what to do. Like when I was a PA and assistant, I was always in somebody's grill, not annoyingly, but I was always like, what can I do for you? What can I learn? How can I be a better artist? And you have to be aggressive. You have to be, there's 300 people that are just waiting to do your job at any given moment. Yeah. You are the luckiest person alive to be an artist in this in this time right now. We have so, like you were saying, we have so many benefactors waiting to pay us to do what we do. Um, yeah. But there's somebody right behind you ready to like take your job. And I'm not <laughs> saying that in a, like a way of like, oh my God, you know, it's not like a, but um, what I'm saying is like, you have to work hard and you, have, yeah. you can't take it for granted. But I know it's really hard too. It, it, it's really difficult because it's, it, you know, to make a living. Um, but you have to trust that it is a process. You know, I was, when I wasn't cutting or assisting, I was um, working on um, Hillary Clinton uh, senatorial ads. I was cutting those on the side. I was doing VH1 uh, ads. You know, I would go back between assisting and cutting for like years because I just had to make a living. And yeah. I would just do anything I can to keep kind of building the pieces and at times being very like worried whether or not any of this was going to work out. But now I have, you know, over 20 years of experience and just realized like it all built on each other. It was literally every single credit built on my first PA job that I worked on for free on a short film, you know, 
that created a network for me. Like all those people started hiring me as a, you know, as a production PA because I ran around like a maniac saying, water bottle, what do you want? Can I help, you know, can I get you a sandwich? You seem like you're hungry. Do you need a blanket? You're cold, you know? And the same thing as an assistant editor, you know, working for the eight editors. Like I was just like, what can I do? How do I digitize? Yes, I will try not to blow up your avid. I don't know how to turn on a computer quite yet, but I will learn how to do it. I promise you. I'm very slow. I'm not very smart, but I'm going to be, I'm going to learn and I'm going to be there for you. And um, I'll so, stay there late to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I will just, I will open up the manual and I'll try to, um, but I would just say to be patient, create your network, reach out to people's people's work that you admire, study, watch things, watch a lot of things. Um, when you get your opportunities, be be on it. Don't be lazy um, and be grateful that you're there. God, what a great interview. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy, you're, you're doing your next film. Uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. I appreciate it. I do this because I love talking to editors and I love talking about our craft and uh, very inspiring stuff, man. Man, I, 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 I have goosebumps right here too because I feel, I feel the same way. Just I really want to be the best editor as possible, but I also want to inspire other people to like, I want them to be like 50 times better than I was. I want people to realize that editing is fucking the the dopest shit out there and we're the ones that make this like really where the real magic happens so well yeah it's time for editors to be heard man you know what i mean i you yeah. know not in a not in a in, a, in an, an annoying way but uh yeah. maybe appreciated uh you know because we we get short shrift so much but i think with all these new yeah. technologies and and stuff we we are starting to get uh you know, to get uh, noticed a little bit more for our contributions. And, uh, you know, like, I think it was David Lean who said, you know, the editor is the final author. It's quite often the final author of a film, uh, you know, depending on whether the director has been fired or, you know, or, or just with the director. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I dig your excitement and I, and I, and I really enjoyed talking to you and I, I wish you nothing but the best of luck. I think you're going to, you're going to, you're going to continue to do great, man. You've got all the, uh, you've got all the, you know, sort of mojo to, uh, you know, an attitude to just continue to do really well. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome to talk to a person like yourself. Oh, thanks, man. It's, um, I really, I really appreciate it. I, I, I can't thank you enough. And, um, I hope, Hope we'll get to talk about it again soon and, and thank you. I really, really appreciate it.